Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, and welcome to another edition of Eye on Islam, the show where we look at current affairs through an Islamic lens. Each week we look at a trending news story and we break it down from an Islamic perspective. On this edition of the program, we will be exploring the concern by many Muslims that attempts to infiltrate and destroy our religion from the inside may be well underway, and with significant Western support as well. A popular stereotype which Muslims living in the West are routinely branded with by the mainstream media is the concept of creeping Sharia, the idea of a great Muslim conspiracy to change the West and implement their own system of governance on an unsuspecting public. However, this conspiracy is false and is largely rooted in right-wing dehumanization of Muslims as a foreign invader. In reality, the roles are flipped. Muslim leaders and activists are raising alarm bells of establishment-backed efforts to infiltrate and change the Muslim community from within. Here are a few noteworthy examples. In Britain, huge support is given to promote and platform a group known as the Ghadiyanis, or sometimes by their preferred name, the Ahmadiyya. The group's claims of being an Islamic sect is heavily supported by the British establishment and cemented with English news reports claiming the same. However, this group is routinely condemned by Muslims worldwide for their heretical beliefs, including a belief in prophets after the final messenger, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Muslim world considers the Ghadianis as a heretical cult backed by the British to further their imperialist interests. Their propaganda is said to cause significant damage to the Dawah, spreading false ideas under the name of Islam. For Shia Muslims, the concept of British Shia and American Sunnis has been warned against by some of the Shia world's highest authorities. Radical preachers based in the West who spread sectarian views or narratives with the purpose of sowing conflict and fitna across the Muslim world has been compared to historical imperialist tactics of divide and rule. Other examples could include the self-described Muslims who enter into secular politics, using their Muslim heritage to score votes but endlessly contradicting Islamic principles when it counts. In some cases, these self-described Muslim politicians support policies including Western aggression on the Muslim world or that criminalize Muslims living in the West. Well, joining us today in the studio to talk about these very concerning issues, we have two esteemed guests. Sayed Mohsen Abbas is a TV producer, broadcaster, presenter and journalist based here in Britain. And Raza Kazim is a human rights activist, political analyst, teacher and presenter as well. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you as always. Uh, Sayed uh, Mohsen, I'm going to come to you first because you're very familiar with uh, these groups that were mentioned uh, among, those are just a few examples. Uh, just tell us, why are they a real danger? What, what problems can they cause for the, the Ummah? Well, first of all, I think to give it context, uh, you have to understand the objectives of those people who are looking to use these groups uh, uh, against Muslims themselves. So that's primarily the neoliberal, neoconservative, uh, Zaya Western imperialist power. That's who really stands to benefit from playing any uh, uh, games within the Muslim world. And they stand to gain basically uh, the, 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 secure, uh, the securitization of their own uh, interests, plunder, uh, political uh, in, uh, and military uh, in those regions. So divide and rule is a well-known old, old tactic and this is no different. What you find is that once uh, the Islamic revolution occurred, because this is the root of the real uh, current contemporary issue that's going on around sectarianism and these issues. So the Islamic Revolution leads to a response from Israel, from the, to the, from the Zionists, from, of course, the British establishment and the American establishment, which kowtows to them. And it leads to coming up with strategies like uh, launching entire wars against them through Saddam Hussein. And cut to the chase, around 9-11, they come up with their ultimate policy to go and literally start invading every country in that region, uh, from Iraq to Afghanistan to Libya, all of it has gone down because of, I think, uh, their fear of the Islamic revolution and the resistance that's rising in that region, which threatens their economic and other interests. So one of the classic tactics uh, in soft power is to infiltrate uh, the 
the enemy, in this case the Muslims for them, and to find their vulnerable points, their weaknesses. And uh, the British especially are ex exceedingly good at this. They have intelligence from back in the uh, 19th century, 18th century onwards, they've been doing this kind of thing. And they have the intel on the Muslim world. So they're the ones who I think led very much in terms of coming up with this notion of creating your own Islamic groups or favoring certain groups in order to break the, the natural push that was coming from uh, the Islamic revolution, the ideals of um, you know, political auton autonomy, sovereignty, independence, those notions of uh, liberty for Muslims and, and for them to take hold of their own lands rather than being uh, ruled by post-colonial imperialists. This is what the real game was about. And they, they nurtured, for instance, Salafism, Wahhabism, that was their first game. The Saudis were initiated back in the 70s to launch a huge amount of uh, finance into the business of sectarianizing the Muslim community. And uh, rather latterly, of course, they've got their uh, fingers in the pie, even with uh, the, the Shia communities around the world, because what they don't want is they don't want uh, a united Shia Marjiyat un under the Marjiyat, or let alone under the auspices of Ayatollah Khamenei, they don't want a kind of uh, a, an Islam rising in Britain which is truly political and, and wants justice and mm. is against those kind of plunder, looting and uh, kind of manipulation, divide and rule policies. So, of course, what do you do? You go and find the most vulnerable people within the Shia communities. You offer them money. You en en enroll them into your, into your sort of educational systems, offer them career incentives, pay direct uh, cash or, or, or simply find the ones who are, are naturally uh, in a, a problem with the Islamic Revolution or the Iranian establishment, and you start mm. buying them into your agenda. And that's exactly what's happened. I think Mossen mentioned very accurately that historically Britain has been known for using a divide and rule strategy to rule over its uh, conquered regions as part of the empire. But the empire is actually gone now. So why is it that groups like the Qadianis, which have a huge uh, temple, whatever you want to call it, in London and a lot of support, other uh, radical preachers seem to be given special status here to preach their hate in the UK. Why is Britain persisting with this strategy today when the empire as we knew it has basically crumbled now? Uh, I think if I can quote uh, Winston Churchill, the ex-Prime Minister of Britain, he said the empires of the future are the empires of the mind. Um, and I think also Steve Biko, in contrast, South African activist who was killed by the apartheid regime actually said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that we really need to think about in terms of how things are actually going. And following on from what Mohsen um, has actually said in uh, how this is... Uh, playing itself out within the, um, you know, when, when you talk about British Shiism or American British uh, Shia Islam and American Sunni Islam, these are concepts and they're not necessarily limited to those geographical areas, although we can really see people who are within the uh, British system actually pandering to this sectarianism. Um, you know, what's his, uh, what's his face, the sectarian scumbag who sits on the members and, you know, the, uh, the Simon Cowell wannabe. Um, you know, he, he's, he's trying to push that kind of agenda. Uh, we also see within the, um, the American Sunni concept, even within Britain, there's some of that where you've got uh, Muslim um, news organizations platforming some of the takfiris who are allowed to do takfir against the Shia. So we've got that whole spectrum of things actually going on, which are a real pro problem. You've also got this idea that you've got to normalize, again, following on from um, what Sayyid Mohsen has said about normalizing um, the proponents of Zionism within the Muslim community. So that they yes. come on um, the TV channels, they come on uh, the community centers where the opposite would not work if mm -hmm. you had people who were going to perhaps speak up for Palestine or something like that. Um, they wouldn't have any of that actually going on. So you've got that normalization actually taking place. The other aspect is this, this idea of depoliticizing um, Muslims, depoliticizing Muslim spaces and depoliticizing Islamic centers um, so that 
any anything that is uh, of sociological concern, uh, sociopolitical concern, or political concern, where there's oppression going on, where there's racism going on, where there's injustice going on, where as we feel that you know one of our concepts of uh, Islam is this idea of having justice, fighting against oppression, standing for the oppressed, and all of those things is very central and core mm -hmm. to who we are as Muslims. And that idea of depoliticization is something that is very much part and parcel of what's actually going on. And there is an attempt to actually social engineer mm. what kind of Islam you would have. So the idea is not to shut down centers or Muslims, mm. but to actually, you know, following on from what Sayyid Mohsen has said, is actually taking things in a direction that will be beneficial for the state. So you would have the buffet service that the, um, you know, the British establishment would actually want Muslims. Okay, you can have this, this and this, mm. but this is not going to be part of uh, what's available on this, uh, on this menu. For sure. Now, uh, before we cut to uh, the next uh, wise words of wisdom, which we're going to play out shortly, let me just very briefly ask you, uh, Sayyid, uh, I guess, could you just list the problems that we've got? What's it? Uh, radical speakers who spread sectarian ideas. They're getting support here. We've got groups that are undermining traditional Islamic beliefs, like belief in other prophets after the prophet. And then we also have, what else? There's like politicians who represent Muslims apparently, but then they undermine Muslims. There's so many examples here. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think from the secular angle, there are people who would call themselves secular Muslims. So they will do anything to conform with whatever, sec whatever secular, neoliberal, muscular neoliberalism uh, wants them to. They have no concern about standing up for justice or being anti-oppression. They're just happy with the pie they have living in the West and absolutely grateful for, for the queen. Well, it's the king now, isn't it? So, and and, and mm. the establishment to continue giving them the, the abundance and plenty which keeps their mouths shut basically. Mm. Uh, then you've got of course the uh, religious uh, fundamentalists as the uh, as the media here likes to put it but basically the Wahhabist Takfiris or the Qadianis all those people in one way shape or form all conform to this agenda of splitting and dividing. The Qadianis do it in a different way. They've always traditionally been very much tucked in as the alternative uh, if, uh, to, to real Islam. They were in British India, along with the Brelvis and many others, part of the movement to suppress the mutiny, su su mm. suppress Indian independence when it rose up in 1857, when there was a genuine uprising. It was these kinds of forces which were all manipulated by the British uh, as sectarian groups to to, uh, to praise the establishment, to suppress any notion of, of mutiny and revolution. So mm -hmm. we're seeing the same thing being done again now. The same groups, the same kind of uh, insipid um, uh, brown noses of establishment coming and doing exactly what they've done historically. It's really almost, if you go and look at Indian history, uh, yeah. you'll see all of this being played out already there. And they're all here in the UK, coincidentally, uh, yeah. including Yasser Habib, another hate preacher who was, I think he was jailed at one point in Kuwait. Now he's in up here he's got his own TV station it seems like some coincidence doesn't it before we continue this discussion let's uh, hear some words of wisdom from Iran's highest authority on the subject as Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei explains what exactly is meant by the dangers of these so-called British Shia and American Sunni Muslims گفتم شیعه انگلیسی و سنی آمریکایی بعضی خیال کردن که ما که میگیم شیعه این اینجور تبلیغ کردن به دروغ که شیعه انگلیسی یعنی شیعه ای که ساکن انگلیس هست. نه شیعه انگلیسی ممکنه در خود کشور اسلامی باشه الهام گیری از انگلیس یعنی شیعه دعوا درست کن سنی دعوا درست کن مثل داعش و مثل وحاوی ها و همثال اینا که دعوا درست میکنه تکفیری ها این کافر اون کافر اینا اسمشون مسلمانه ممکنه متعبدن باشن به احکام فردی اسلامی اما در خدمت دشمن حرکت میکنه این که اختلاف ایجاد میکنه در خدمت دشمن well, there you have it. Um, very clear. I mean, this is something which uh, the, the Sayyid has had to speak on several times, Sayyid Khamenei, because of this continuing persistent threat that's evolved over time uh, and has continued to plague the Muslim community in many different ways. 
Uh, let me just ask you about this specific point, the, the one he made about British Shia and American Sunni. He explained that, you know, he's not talking about Muslims living here. He's talking about uh, bootlickers, essentially, Western-backed Muslims who are undermining traditional Islam, undermining the power of the Ummah, basically. Uh, so perhaps, again, you could just emphasize this point to our audience. How dangerous is this and what danger could it have from here, even over in the Muslim world as well? I think it's 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 like this term that was uh, said about Gufis who um, you know uh, betrayed Imam Hussein at the time of Karbala and so on and so forth. It's that mm. same same kind of idea that you've got British Shias, uh, you've got American Sunnis, and the idea is to actually say quite clearly that um, you are depoliticizing, disempowering. Uh, Muslims to be able to say what uh, is the right thing to say, to stand up against oppression, to uh, say things at the time that the British state wants you to say certain things mm. and not say other things because the British state at that point in time doesn't want you to say those things, mm. to encourage sectarianism within the Muslim community from both angles, from both sides, to actually um, promote hatred between the Muslims. So when you've got Muslims fighting amongst each other, then you will not have them fighting against the oppression and yeah. for standing for the oppressed. That's the danger of fitna, basically. That's what this is. This Absolutely. Is a, this and is it, a fitna coming. And, and, it's, and it's something that is um, about social engineering, a specific type of Islam where you'll have someone who is looking like a Muslim, doing everything, you know, like Imam Khamenei said, um, in their personal affairs, is doing everything that a good Muslim should be doing, mm. and yet they are disempowered from actually saying, um, standing up for at a community level, the concept of Ummah, that we're not just uh, individuals, um, mm. we are a part of a community that is supposed to stand up for justice, and yes. so on and so forth, and disempowering them here and abroad and mm. using the people here to actually influence what goes on abroad. Um, going into those communities, we've seen uh, there's evidence, money trails and so on, of how people have actually gone in yes. and influenced the direction of where a Muslim community abroad is going to go and what they're actually mm. going to do. So I think this is something that needs to be guarded against. For sure. And I, I think I understand more so now, uh, Sayyid Mosin, about the whole concept of, you know, I can say I'm a British Muslim because I'm a Muslim living in Britain and I'm British by nationality. But to say I, I follow British Islam, that's really dodgy, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, Islam is Islam. And I look to the Middle East and the homeland of Islam, proper scholars about this. I don't look to the British royal family who give a few occasional quotes from the Quran as if they're an authority of the British government. Uh, you know, we have to be clear here. You know, I can be a Muslim living in Britain, but we follow Islam, and Islam comes from the Quran at the end of the day. And not be taken in, if I can come in, yeah. or this uh, concept uh, that uh, Prince Charles, as he was then, said, defender of the faiths, to somehow make himself out to be in, in that yeah, kind of mold. Yeah, he's no defender of my faith at all, is he? I, I think th there is a very subtle uh, trick being played. You see, the new generation that's coming up, they haven't grown up in, uh, in, in the countries back home. They don't have the, the same sort of routines. Many of them don't know about uh, the political uh, situations in those countries either. That's mm. the reality. And what the, what, the, what the Western establishment is trying to do with the Muslims here is the same thing they've done with Christianity. So if you look at Christianity as, as a parallel to this, they've totally depoliticized uh, Christianity. There's no uh, fight for justice or anti-oppression movement that you discernibly see coming from the church mm. or the, the, the church establishment or any formal establishment. You'll see them cornered into doing social work or welfare work or helping people in kind of vague ways, but never to do with justice, political justice mm. or social justice on, with, with a, on the big stage. So they've basically turned Christianity into a kind of a political eunuch, essentially. Yes. And it's that's what they defeated want. Defeated force, basically. basically. Defeated and, and force, no uh, following no following of that kind and no ability to give them the direction that they require. The Pope himself fails, let alone uh, the Church of England. None of them have the ability or, or the inclination, actually, because they're all part of the same establishment. That's the mm. reality. So the Muslims are now gradually being herded and regimented into this same process of yes. trying to create a kind of a, an Islam which is com uh, conformative, uh, conforming to uh, British policy at every mm. stage. And that's, that's a, a problem uh, because it will also mean that tomorrow you know, if there's a war on Syria, and, and they literally did, you know, if, if there's a war in Afghanistan, a war in Libya, here the population is currently maybe six million Muslims. 
another 15, 20 years, that's likely mm. to be 15 or 20 million Muslims. So you can see from a, a political perspective to have a set of Muslims who are depoliticized is hugely beneficial for the establishment. They want to cut the, uh, the ties between Muslims here and the actual Muslim world, which they're at war with basically most of the time. I think that's the point you're trying to make very, very well. Uh, Reza, let me come in because uh, there's another example here which we have to include in the show of where, uh, you know, I think Muslims living in the West can sometimes betray their own community uh, through essentially working with the establishment on, uh, for example, the, there's an issue with mosques being infiltrated and having non-Muslims installed by the state to manage over them and their, tr their charity status. Fill us in on this story and this problem. Make it easy to understand if you yeah, can for so our this audience. Is, so this is something that uh, the Islamic Human Rights Commission has taken up as a campaign about Save Our Mosques because uh, it is something that the British state via the Charity Commission is actually targeting mosques um, uh, across the Muslim spectrum and taking them over in appointing interim managers and saying what can and cannot be done. Uh, this is in direct violation of the Quranic verse which clearly states that the people that, who should be maintaining the mosque should be um, you know, uh, Muslims and people who are following course, uh, yes. the Muslim faith, the, the, the um, principles of the Muslim faith and so on and so forth. I'm yes. paraphrasing um, that verse and, and it's, it's very, clear, very, very clearly stipulated uh, that non-Muslims uh, or people appointed by a non-Muslim institution cannot be running uh, a mosque because it will whether um, because first of all then they are they are following the agenda of a non-Muslim they're not following the agenda that is an Islamic agenda regardless of the sect of Islam that you belong to and we see that whether it's uh, whatever spectrum of the Muslim community you come from whether it's Shia Sunni it's Barelvi etc uh, mosques have been targeted and interim managers appointed and it and it is deeply disturbing that this is going on and uh, and one of the things that's happening is the amount of pressure that's being piled onto them people trustees sometimes feel that they have to um, try and get the mosque open at all costs and um, you know I'll take the example of the Islamic Centre um, in Maidavale which is um, uh, incidentally linked uh, to um, uh, Imam Khamenei and, and so on and so forth and one of the things that uh, has actually happened there which is quite uh, you know um, that has been going over, over, over the past year is that there have been Islamophobic attacks and racist attacks against the mosque where it's been physically damaged the people inside have been attacked uh, mm. uh, hurt and you know have, uh, some people from the Muslim community have been, has been hospitalized as a result of the um, anti-Muslim hatred and rampage uh, that took place across London mm. um, and ended up at the uh, Islamic Center and people were um, you know uh, had to be taken to hospital for treatment and so on so this kind of thing was going on and as a, and the police weren't doing their job so people from the Muslim community um, uh, who were going to this particular place and in fact others from uh, different parts of the Muslim community actually came together um, and said right we're going to stand up and we're going to if the police aren't going to defend this place we are and uh, we stood together shoulder to shoulder and said right come on come now if you dare mm. and as a result of that and us pushing back and uh, pr being prepared to sacrifice because when um, those thugs were going to attack it, were, it was going to be physical attacks we would have had mm. to defend it physically a lot of those people were are professionals who will uh, as a community would have lost millions sure. um, who uh, people who would have lost their livelihoods people who would have uh, gone and uh, so on and so forth so I think it's something that people need to recognize in the center that there were people mm. who were prepared to defend it and when the, this takeover happened it was an insult that uh, the Islamic Center was being taken over by a non-Muslim mm. and the trustees have capitulated they've capitulated uh -huh. and allowed this interim manager to uh, run the place and have opened the place of worship instead of resisting and this is something that is um, completely un unacceptable because it is against what Rehba would have wanted and it is something that is in violation of the verse of the Quran. Sure. It's basically a, a case of a mosque which the British establishment doesn't like because it's showing uh, independence uh, and they're now cracking down on it. This is a fantastically interesting story. Unfortunately, we have no time, gentlemen, but we will be uh, talking about this in the future, I assure you, as we have done on other shows. Unfortunately, yes, that is all the time we have for this edition of the show. Thank you to our guests and thank you at home for watching as well. Join us again next week for another edition of Al Islam. Salaamu Alaikum for now.
Coco. 